Hello and welcome back. In today's video, I'm going through the schematic capture and hardware design for an STM32W55. This microcontroller is Bluetooth capable. That's one of the functionalities that I want to get from this. In addition to the Bluetooth, I also have a IMU on this, which stands for Inertial Measurement Unit. So on the screen now, you can see my schematic for this board. And what I will do is I've already drawn up the schematic, so I'll just walk you through it, kind of highlight the main aspects of the design. So first of all, let me tell you my kind of design intent for this board. So what I want to do is at the moment design a development board, which I can use as a platform to test Bluetooth and the IMU capabilities. So I'm not really space constrained or anything like that. But eventually what I will do is try and shrink all of this schematic down into a very small board so i'll need to start reducing the component counts and obviously like debugging features and things like that i'll start removing as well such as this led this led here this led and maybe just look at reducing some of the capacitors to see how the functionality is affected so i want to try and minimize the components as much as possible for my final design but for the first one it's more of a functionality test and that's what i'm aiming for on this so first of all, I have a STM32W55 processor or microcontroller that I'm using, which is a Bluetooth capable board and has basically a blue RF output on pin 21. And for this design, I'm mainly following the guidelines that are provided on this application note on the screen now, which is AN5165. On the application note, you've got the recommendations or the reference design for a typical RF design for Bluetooth. So most of the components are following the recommendations from this application note. So we've got a 50 ohms matching network over here. We've got a filter, a low pass filter over here, which I'm using the same part numbers. And then we have a internal SMPS or switch mode power supply, which needs two inductors and a capacitor. All of that is basically derived from the application note. We also have um, some oscillators and everything, which I will talk about in more detail when I go through the schematic capture. So staying on the microcontroller for a little bit longer, the main aspects for the microcontroller that we need to capture in the schematic is the decoupling. So decoupling, you can obtain that from the STM32 datasheet on page 82, which has the decoupling configuration. To quickly show you that, this is what's recommended from the datasheet. And this is exactly what I've followed on my design. The RF hardware design recommends a secondary inductor for the RF design. So this configuration over here, for every VDD pin, we have a 100 nanofarad capacitor plus a large value 4.7 microfarad capacitor for the microcontroller, which would need to be close to the microcontroller, but not as close as the 100 nanofarad capacitors. For the analog pin, Although I'm not using any analog functions on this board at the moment, you have a 10 nanofarad capacitor and a one microfarad capacitor. For the switch mode power supply, you've got a 4.7 microfarad capacitor and VDD USB, which we are using has a 100 nanofarad capacitor. So just going back to my schematic, you can see I've got all those capacitors over here. So looking at this pin count, so we've got one, two, three, four, five, but one, two, three, four, five, so we've got 500 nanofarad capacitors per input pin, which is denoted with VDD and that bulk 4.7 microfarad capacitor over here. For the RF section, we need a 100 nanofarad capacitor as well as a 100 picofarad capacitor, which is recommended from the data sheet. And for the USB, we have 100 nanofarad capacitor and the switch mode power supply has a 4.7 microfarad capacitor as well as a 100 nanofarad capacitor. Another thing that we need to get this working is these inductors over here and this 4.7 microfarad capacitor over here, which is needed for the SMPS or the internal switch mode power supply feedback and the uh, switching network over here. So again, following the kind of guidelines provided by the data sheet. The last thing for the microcontroller is the programming header, which I am using serial wire debug on this case. I have a 20 pin header on my ST-Link V2. So that's what I'm using. Basically, I've got a 20 pin header on the PCB. And what I want to do is have it side mounted so I can plug into the board 
and program up the microcontroller with the ST link. Obviously you can go for a smaller one which I will need to eventually for my final design. I have also added functionality for USB communication. So using a USB-C connector but running USB 2.0. So you can see I have a USB-C connector over here with a protection IC. So these are just, well, there is a Zener diode or a Transorb TVS diode in between. And we have some pull up diodes on the D minus and D plus lines. So after the protection, they go to the microcontroller on PA11 and PA12. And to find the necessary pinouts or where the pinout should go to on the microcontroller, I'm using STM32 Cube MX, which if I go to connectivity over here, USB and activate the full speed USB device, it will give me the pinouts that are capable of doing USB. So in this case, it's only PA11 and PA12. And this is the same thing for the programming, which I'm using a serial wire debug. And to do that, you basically go into system core, sys, and select trace asynchronous SW, which will give you these pins over here. So that's basically the USB. On the connector itself, we also have two 5K11 resistors, and this is needed for the USB-C protocol. And that allows us to pull power from the host device. The five volts from the USB goes to a linear 3v3 regulator. So keeping the design as simple as possible, I'm using a MIC 5205 3.3 Y5, which has the capability of doing up to 150 milliamps output. I don't think I will need that much at all on this processor, and you can do an estimation of the current on this software as well. On the regulator, I have a LED and a resistor over here, and this basically indicates that five volts is coming through. And on this side, I have a resistor and LED, which indicates that the 3.3 volts is working as well. You can see I've added some test points on this, and this is to allow me to test the PCB once it's manufactured. Another thing I've done is connected up or added two header pins for the 3v3 power supply and the 5 volt power supply over here. And this lets me connect up these two supply rails if I need to, just in case something over here isn't working properly, or if I need to test some different things. As I said before, one of the kind of functionalities that I want from this is an IMU to detect orientation of the PCB. And for that, I'm using a LIS2DH12TR port number. And this can be configured to use SPI or I squared C. I'm using it in I squared C mode. To select I squared C mode, you basically need to pull the chip select pin up to 3.3 volts and that will configure the IC to be on I squared C mode. So you can see I've got my I squared C connected to this line over here on PB9 and PB8 on the microcontroller and pins 4 and 1 on the IMU. Similar to the USB, you need to basically come over to stmcube32, select I squared C and then in this case, we might have an alternative pin configuration. So if I was to hover over this, we can see it's got I squared C1 SCL over here. So I don't have any alternative functions for this, but if you, I think if you press control and left mouse button, it gives you alternate options. So you can see PB8 is SCL and PB9 is SDA. I'm using two 5K11 pull-up resistors. Again, I think the recommended values are less than 5K or less than 4K 7 ohms. But I'm using 5K11 to test it out. If it doesn't work, I'll change it to a smaller value resistor. But this is basically to minimize bomb lines. So I don't want to create additional resistor lines on my bill of materials if I don't need to. So I've just added 5K1 resistors here. They should work, but if they don't, I can swap them out. For pull-up, I'm also using a 5K1 resistor. Again, same reason. And then on this IMU, we also have external interrupt pin, which is two pins. I'm not entirely sure about the functionality of them at the moment, but I will learn more about it as I do the kind of software for this board. But what I have done is connected up these two pins to pins PA0 and PA2. And I've done this because I want the processor to be able to go into deep sleep mode. And 
there are only some pins on the microcontroller that have the capability to wake up the processor from deep sleep mode. So if you go to page 38, there is a note underneath some table which tells you that the pins with wake up capability are PA0, PC13, PC12, PA2 and PC5. So I've basically used PA0 and PA2 for this functionality. So that covers everything on the IMU. So the main part over here is the RF, which you can see goes from here to here. So this 50 ohm matching network is from the application note. This filter is also from the application note. And then we have a chip antenna capable of doing Bluetooth. Again, I suggest if you're trying to do a similar design, you use this application note. And then other things that we have on this board, we have a high speed oscillator and we have a low speed external oscillator as well, which I've not selected these crystals yet. So the capacitance values are also TBD. I believe this processor has internal load capacitors for the crystal. So I have added functionality to add the capacitors just in case if they are needed, but I've designated them as do not populate. So you can do that by double clicking a part and pressing do not populate, and then that will get rid of the component. In addition to do not populate, you can also exclude that from the bill of materials. But in my case, I want to leave it there. I will just add a note that says do not include on the design or do not include for the assembly. The last thing I have on this side of the schematic is this little network over here. And this is to put the microcontroller into the bootloader mode, which is on PH3. So what this does is if you hold the push button down during startup, the microcontroller will go into bootloader mode. And this is by pulling the pin up to 3v3. You can see I've got a 1K resistor for ESD protection and I've got two 5K11 resistors as pull down. I could get away with just one resistor, but I'm just going to include two for now. And again, I'm keeping 5K11 values to reduce the bomb lines. Another important thing is the reset pin. Now the data sheet for this microcontroller recommends a 100 microfarad capacitor on the reset pin, which is what I've got over here. Another thing I can do is if someone else is designing this board is, is add a little note here that tells the PCB designer to place this capacitor close to this microcontroller. Obviously in the schematic, it would be quite messy for me to do that. Now the last thing on this schematic is this expansion header that I've put down. On the expansion header, I've added my 3v3 and the five volt lines and some additional pinouts from this microcontroller. Now just quickly looking at PA4, you can see I can use them as ADC. I can use them as interrupts. I can do SPI on them. I can do UART as well. So this gives me a lot of functionality if I need to use it. I don't think I will, but it's better to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it. Another thing I have on this board is these non bill of material items. So the fiducials for the PCB assembly and then some mounting holes so that the PCB is stable when I'm testing it. I've added some fabrication notes from the JLC PCB, which is the PCB fabrication facility that I'm going to be using for this board. And their recommended size for the fiducials is one millimeter copper with a two millimeter mass clearance. And they also recommend three to four fiducials on the PCB or the edge of the PCB. And they want a 3.35 millimeter clearance from the edge for the fiducials. So you can see that on the JLC PCB website where they recommend the fiducial sizes and the clearances. So you will need a 0.5 millimeter clearance for all the components. And they have a edge rail requirement as well, which they want five millimeters minimum as their standard functionality. And this is the requirements for the fiducials. So you've got one millimeter copper with a two millimeter solder mask opening. So that basically covers everything that I have on this board. In the next video, I will go through the PCB design for this board. And then finally, I will go through the software as well, which might take a little bit longer because Bluetooth is going to be new to me. Before I do that, obviously I will need to select the antenna and the crystals, but I will leave a link for the bill of materials for this PCB in the description as soon as it's ready. Thank you for watching today. 
And if you have any comments or suggestions for me, please leave them in the comment section below.